Let us now unite our hearts in prayer to God. <coughs> our Father, who art in heaven, we thank thee that we can come again before thy holy presence to worship thee in thy sanctuary. We come believing that thou art with us. We come in wonderment and amazement before thee, confessing thee to be the one and only true God, the blessed God, the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the God who sits enthroned in glory and majesty in the heavens, the God of our salvation in Jesus Christ. All of these things are so great, and they fill our hearts with reason to come before thee, to worship and to adore thee, and to praise thy great and holy name. We are mindful of the fact that we can come before thy presence only through our mediator, our Lord Jesus Christ. He who was born in Bethlehem is now ascended into heaven and is before thy presence making continual intercession for us. He is our heavenly mediator and it is only through faith in him that we can approach thy throne and that we can offer our worship before thee. For we are mindful of our own sinfulness, our own unworthiness. We know that thou art holy and that should we come before thee in ourselves, we surely would be consumed. We thank thee for the wonder of being able to worship thee and to serve thee in thy house. We thank thee that thou hast ordained in thy church that thy word should be preached. And this is the means through which thou dost speak unto thy people. We pray for thy servant as he brings thy word that he may do so in humility, with sincerity of heart and with the authority of the office which thou hast given to him. May he be able to speak thy word alone through the power of thy Holy Spirit. And may we as thy church humble ourselves, listening with quietness of heart, in fear and trembling, realizing that this is thy word and that it is absolutely true. Give us, O Lord, the faith to receive thy word. Give us spiritual understanding of its truth and cause that thy word may instruct us concerning thyself and concerning our salvation in Jesus Christ. May we also, through thy word, be equipped for our life, for we are called to live in the midst of an ungodly world, and we are called to testify in that world of the glory of thy name. We know that the world in which we live is filled with ungodliness and with many temptations and we are easily led astray by the temptations of the world. We pray that thy word may equip us so that we might be able to stand, that we might be able to discern in our lives that which is good and pleasing in thy sight and that we may never yield to the temptations of the devil and of this ungodly world. And so may we live as thy people, a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. 
We pray, O God, that thou would bless us as a church. We thank thee for the wonder of thy church among us. We thank thee for the communion of the saints that we enjoy together through the common faith that we have by the Spirit who dwells in our hearts. May we serve one another in humility and in love, encouraging and supporting each other in the truth of thy word. Bless our office bearers as they rule over us and as they care for us. Bless our pastor, Reverend Van Overloop. We thank thee for him. Wilt thou continue to be with him in his ministry among us. We pray that thou wilt bless us as a congregation as we are called to be a witness also in this community. We pray for the denomination of which we are a part. We thank thee for that denomination and for the heritage of the truth which thou hast given to her. May we hold that heritage true and faithful. May we be courageous to stand for the truth in times of great apostasy. May we not be ashamed nor in any way compromise thy word in order that we might gain the favor and glory of men. Give us readiness to proclaim thy word, not only in our local congregations, but also in the mission field. We thank thee for our mission fields here in America and also in the Philippines. We thank thee for Reverend Klein and Reverend Smith who labor there and who live there with their families. Bless the congregation there. Preserve her in the midst of an evil nation and be pleased to gather thy church with her. We pray for thy church wherever she is in this world. We know that she exists in many places that we do not know. And we know that we know only but a very small part of her number. Thou dost sit enthroned in the heavens and rule over all the nations, and thou dost gather thy church according to thy purposes of election, in order that thy people might be called out through the preaching of the gospel and be formed as thy church. We pray for thy saints who are in lands where there is severe persecution, where there is war and famine and great danger and terrorism, distress. We pray that in these times thou wilt preserve thy church we know that all of these things must take place according to thy purpose. The judgments of thy righteousness must come upon this earth as the beginning of the final judgment that shall come at the end of the ages. We have, together with all of thy saints, the blessed hope of the glorious appearing the coming of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray that thou will hasten that day and that we may look for it with eager anticipation and longing. May our lives be in harmony with that blessed hope which thou hast given to us. Be with us now as we continue to worship before thee. Keep our minds focused upon the truth of thy word. We desire one thing, O oh God, again, in our worship service. We desire that thy name might be worshiped and glorified, and that our Lord Jesus Christ might be exalted in the midst of thy church through the preaching of thy word and through the worship of thy people. Hear us again for thy name's sake. Amen. 
Let us now worship the Lord with our offerings. The offerings this evening are for Foreign Seminary Student Fund and for Special Education. Let us join again in the worship of singing, singing Psalter number 241, the first four verses of number 241. We read from God's word this evening as it's found in Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. We begin reading with verse 21 and read through verse 35. Beginning with verse 21 and reading through verse 35. And when eight days were accomplished for the circumcision of the child, his name was called Jesus, which was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the days of her purification according to the law of Moses were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord, 
a pair of turtle doves, or two young pigeons. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, then took he him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. And Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel, and for a sign which shall be spoken against. Yea, a sword shall pierce through thine own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. We pay special attention to the last verses from verse 25 to verse 35. We focus our attention on Simeon and the vision that God by the Holy Spirit gave to this aged saint of God. Simeon was a beautiful example of a saint of God. He lived just at the time of the transition from the Old Testament into the New Testament age. He was an illustration of the passing of the old and the coming of the new. Amazingly, by the Holy Spirit, Simeon had faith in God and in Christ Jesus. He was an example in many ways of the saints of the Old Testament. His hope was in God and in the promise of the coming Messiah. He had a, a personal faith. He looked for the salvation of his own soul. Mine eyes, he said, have seen thy salvation. That salvation was for Simeon the cause of great joy. When he experienced, when he saw the blessed reality of that fulfillment in the coming of the Messiah according to the promise of the Old Testament. But he did not merely have a concern for his own personal salvation. He had a great concern for the salvation of God's people, of the Israel, of God. He was part of that nation and evidently part of the true Israel of God, the spiritual, the elect Israel of God. And Simeon had even a greater concern than that. For in his prophecy, he speaks of the light of salvation, which would become the glory of the Gentiles. 
Simeon was not an exclusivistic Jew, proud of his mere external nationalism. He had an understanding given to him by the Spirit of God that the purpose of God was to save his people from all the nations of the earth. And therefore he was an exceptional saint of God at his time. His life is recorded, his confession, his prophecy is recorded in the scriptures for our example. It's a beautiful passage to consider just after we have celebrated the incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is at the same time a beautiful passage to consider as we come to the end of another year and as we look forward to be the beginning of a new year. What a beautiful saint of God, Simeon was. He came into the temple of God at the time of the presentation of Jesus. There were two ceremonies that were required by the Old Testament law, and these were performed at this time. There was the ceremony that involved the cleansing of the mother. That was necessary because all things are done in sin and because we conceive our children in sin. So there had to be in the Old Testament the cleansing of the mother. And this was a ceremony that required for those who could afford it the sacrifice of a lamb. And for those who were poor, this sacrifice would be the sacrifice of two pigeons. This indicated that Joseph and Mary were lowly and poor. The second ceremony involved the redemption of the firstborn. This ceremony harked back to the time of the deliverance of Israel out of Egypt. At that time, the angel of death went over Israel, or rather over the land of Egypt, to slay the firstborn. The firstborn in Israel were redeemed. They were redeemed by the blood that was painted on the doorpost. These firstborn were a symbol of the entire new generation in Israel, the covenant generation. And therefore, these were presented to the Lord. The tribe of Levi was the substitute for the firstborn, and a sacrifice had to be made. A ceremony was accomplished in the temple for the redeeming of the firstborn. Jesus, when he came into this world, submitted himself to the law of God. It would be easy to preach a sermon entirely on just that part of the passage that we are considering. He came to fulfill the law on our behalf. But our sermon tonight will be broader than that. We consider tonight Simeon and the Christ child. Simeon and the Christ child. Notice, first of all, who Simeon was. Secondly, what was revealed to him concerning the Christ child. And finally, his prophecy regarding the Christ of God. Simeon was apparently an ordinary saint of God. There is nothing told us in the scriptures that he held any special office. And yet he was filled with the Holy Spirit. He is very unique in that respect, and he is a foreshadowing of 
the office of all believers that we now have after Pentecost and after the Spirit of Christ has been poured out upon us. The Spirit of God came upon Simeon. It was only through the Spirit of God that he was given such wonderful understanding of the things of God and of the fulfillment of the promise of salvation, the covenant promise of God. It was only through the Holy Spirit that Simeon could recognize the child, the babe, Jesus, in its mother's arm. Certainly this was something very unusual and something very wonderful. By the Spirit of God, he was enabled to prophesy concerning Christ. To declare the things of God, the counsel of God, before that counsel would be realized after the crucifixion and exaltation of Jesus Christ. What an amazing thing that was. And we today, we have the Spirit of Christ by whom we know these wonderful things that Simeon understood. We are told in this passage that Simeon was a just and a devout man. The word just here refers to his forensic, his legal righteousness. That's the meaning of the term here. It has the same meaning, this term, as what we are told in Genesis 15 and verse 6 concerning Abraham. There we read that Abraham believed God and he, that is God, counted it to him for righteousness. So Simeon was justified by faith. By faith in the promise of God. He understood that promise and he believed in God and God declared him to be righteous. So blessed was Abraham and so blessed were all the saints of God in the Old Testament already when they could look for the promise and when they believed that promise. What a wonder that already in the Old Testament they could understand God's promise and by the Spirit working in the hearts of the saints of God they held fast to the promise. They longed for the fulfillment of that promise and they were justified. They were among those people, those blessed people who are righteous in God's sight and who are therefore the objects of his favor and love. Simeon was also a devout man. The word devout means that Simeon was spiritually consecrated to God. He loved God. His life was devoted to God. He was serious about keeping the commandments of God and living a holy life. No, he didn't do that yet perfectly. For if he was perfect in doing that, then he would not have longed for the coming of Christ as Simeon did. Simeon longed for his perfect salvation. And so this description of Simeon is really a beautiful description of justification and sanctification and the relationship of these two those who are justified in Christ and 
have the spirit of Jesus Christ, they also are sanctified in him. By the spirit they are consecrated to God. By the Holy Spirit, Simeon was waiting for the consolation of Israel. He believed that the coming of the Messiah would be the consolation, the comfort of God's people. He believed that that comfort involved the person of the Messiah whom God would send into the world. Few in the days of Simeon believed that anymore, for Judah was at the time in great darkness and apostasy. Most of the people of Judah were carnal and worldly, Many of them had forgotten the Lord's promise, and because of that, they were without hope and without consolation. Simeon believed that the coming of the promised Messiah would be the consolation of God's people. He did not limit that though important it was that that consolation was personal for him. He was looking for his own personal consolation, but he also was waiting for the consolation of Israel, for he loved the true Israel of God, and he longed also for the salvation and the comfort of God's people. That nation of Israel was hated and persecuted in the world. At the time, it was under the cruel oppression of the Roman Empire. Simeon was looking for the consolation, the comfort, through the deliverance and salvation of Israel. God had given to Simeon a most blessed and wonderful Promise. We are told that in our text. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Now how that came to Simeon, we are not told. No doubt it was by some special revelation that God showed to Simeon that he would not see death, he would not depart from this world until he had seen the Lord's Christ. Simeon was at the time an aged man. He was ready to depart from this world. He knew that. And that determined the perspective of his life. He knew that he would soon die because he was old. The time would come when he would have to stand before the Lord, his maker, in heaven. But he had hope in God and in Jesus Christ. And among the other things that Simeon is a beautiful example of, he is an example of an aged saint of God who has this peace and this comfort that Simeon had. In the days of youth, we can be so caught up with the things of this world, with our careers, our families, our plans, our progress, our success in the world, our achievements, making money, buying a house perhaps, settling down, having a family, and none of these things are in themselves bad, of course, as long as we don't set our hearts 
upon these things, as long as in the midst of all of these things, we do not become carnal and worldly. Always our heart has to be set on God. But when one grows older and he arrives or she arrives to the years of being a senior and the sober reality is upon such a person that the end of life is coming quickly, the end of our earthly pilgrimage. We lay hold more dearly and more tightly to the promise of God as Simeon did. And we have that promise that Simeon had only in Old Testament form at the time. We have that promise now in God's word. And as that promise has been fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. What a beautiful thing that was for Simeon. He received that special revelation of God that he would not see death until he had seen the Lord's Christ. Until the promise of God out of which he had lived all the days of his life until that wonderful promise was now realized in the incarnation of the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. He was filled with the Spirit of God, and because of that Spirit of God in him, he could recognize the babe Jesus. Mary and Joseph were a poor couple. If you would lay your eyes on them, they would not be in any way glorious. They would not be outstanding in the audience that came into the temple on that day. But God revealed this to Simeon, and his attention was focused not just on Mary and Joseph, but it was focused on the babe that Mary carried in her arms, an ordinary babe, not a baby with a halo around its head, but an ordinary baby. And God gave him to understand the amazing wonder of faith that this baby was the promised Messiah. Hardly no one at the time had recognized the amazing reality of this. And Simeon took this baby in his arms and embraced him in love and great joy and with wonder and amazement. Try to imagine, if you will, aged Simeon holding the baby Jesus in his arms. And he was overwhelmed with joy and awe and with amazement. And he said, Now let us thou, thy servant, depart in peace according to thy word. When he saw Jesus, he could make that confident confession, now let us thou thy servant depart in peace. To depart means to die. Now that Simeon had seen Jesus, he was ready to die without being afraid, he was ready to die. Death is a fearful thing. The Bible tells us that it is appointed unto men once to die, and after that, the judgment. There is no greater fear for man than the fear 
of death. And if one has no hope in Jesus Christ, then death is a dread and a terror to die without Christ is a dreadful thing for the wicked. That day will be the day of their judgment. But Simeon, holding the baby Jesus in his arms, he was ready to die in peace and he could make that beautiful confession. Now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people. If you want to learn, memorize a beautiful passage of scripture, children, you ought to memorize this beautiful confession. Now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation. Simeon was ready now to die in peace. The peace of God, the peace of Jesus Christ, the peace of the righteousness that Christ would accomplish on the cross and in his resurrection. When we have that peace, beloved, we do not need to be afraid of death. For then we are delivered from the fear of death. Only the child of God has that peace. And that peace is a peace that passes all understanding. It's a peace that delivers us from all the fears of this world, from all the fears of the sorrow and the suffering of this world. There is so much in this world that is so fearful. The hatred, the ungodliness of this world, the wicked have no peace, the war of this world, the calamity of this world, the judgments that are coming upon this world, the terrorism of our present time, the economic recession of our time, the chaos in the world, the uncertainty of the future of man and of even our own nation. Who can say what is going to happen in these troublesome times in which we are living? The child of God who has beheld by faith the wonder of the Lord Jesus Christ in the midst of all of these fearful things. He has the peace of God in Jesus Christ. Mine eyes have seen thy salvation. Simeon saw that salvation. He knew the truth of that salvation from the infallible scriptures he was acquainted with, the scriptures he knew, the promises of the Old Testament. He knew the doctrine of God's word. And he knew that God had promised according to his covenant that his people would be saved through the Messiah. He knew all of these truths. But he understood also that the, his salvation was bound up in the person of God and in the person of Jesus, the Son of God. He knew, amazingly, by the Spirit of God, he knew that the truth of God's covenant meant that God would come into human flesh as Emmanuel. He had Emmanuel in his arms. 
he could look right into the face of the Lord Jesus Christ and he believed that his peace and comfort would be realized personally by the Lord Jesus Christ. He could see that in a sense even with his physical eyes. Of this truth the Apostle John testifies in his epistle in chapter 1 when he said that which was from the beginning which we have heard which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life for the life was manifested and we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us that which we have seen declare we unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son Jesus Christ and these things write we unto you that your joy might be full. When Simeon had the baby Jesus in his hands when he looked at the wonder of the incarnation, he experienced the blessed truth of the salvation of God realized in his son, Jesus Christ. And we, we have the spirit of Christ. We have celebrated in this season the coming of God's Son into our flesh, have we, have, have we seen him? Have we beheld him by faith and has our heart been filled with joy and peace and comfort to know the Christ whom God has sent into the world for our salvation? What a joy and what a comfort that brings to the heart and soul of the true child of God of which Simeon was such a beautiful type. By the same spirit of God that filled Simeon, he could prophesy concerning Christ, that Christ Jesus was the salvation which God himself had prepared before the face of all people. It was a salvation that God prepared. How we love that truth as Reformed believers, don't we? It's not a salvation that we merit, that we accomplish by our own works. It's not a man-centered religion that is the religion of apostate America. Such a religion has no hope and no joy, finally. But it's the true religion that has hope in the salvation which God has prepared. He has ordained it. He has realized it by his almighty power. He has fulfilled his promise. He has done those things which for man is entirely impossible. He has accomplished the wonder of his grace. He has prepared the salvation of his people and he will declare that salvation before the face of all people. The gospel will be preached in the New Testament to all nations and that salvation by God himself will be prepared before the face of all people. The elect of God from all nations will come to know the wonder of that salvation as God has and does reveal it to us in the person of his son, Jesus Christ. That's what we celebrate in this season of the year, the wonder of our salvation realized in the incarnation 
of the Lord Jesus Christ. Simeon goes on to declare in his amazing prophecy that by this son and the salvation of God prepared in this son, there will be a light, a light that lightens the Gentiles. He will be the glory of my people Israel. Light speaks of hope, of life, of knowledge, and of joy. One of the most common figures in the Bible is the figure of light, and it's a very clear and a very beautiful figure. The world in which we live lives in darkness, in the darkness of ungodliness, the darkness of wickedness and evil and sickness and suffering and of the curse. It's a world of darkness and no knowledge of man, no increase of that knowledge can and does deliver the world from its terrible darkness. The age in which we live is characterized as the age of enlightenment. It is the age of the explosion of knowledge. It is the age of the computer and the internet and the availability of knowledge as never before, the expansion of knowledge and of learning and of technology and of invention and of the <coughs> wisdom of this world. But none of these things deliver this ungodly world from its darkness. But in fact, in the midst of all of this great knowledge and learning, the world is descending deeper and deeper into the blackness and darkness of ungodliness and of sin and wickedness. There's only one light in that dark world. As Isaiah prophesied, the people that sat in darkness have seen a great light. And that light is the light of salvation in Jesus Christ, the glorious light of God the light of hope, of righteousness, of life and glory and salvation. That's the glory of God. And that's the light that now shines in the gospel which has been preached and is preached to the nations of the Gentiles. Simeon could already understand that and he could prophesy of that. He could testify of the truth of that salvation that would someday come also to us and that would be preached in our midst here in grace. What a wonderful truth that is. Furthermore, he testifies of this child that this child is set for the fall and the rising again of many. A very distinctive and antithetical word of God. This Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, is set for the fall of many. Not all will believe. Not all will be saved by him. All of Scripture testifies of that. Christ will come to his own, and his own will not receive him. The light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehendeth it not. Why not? Because the deeds of this world are evil. There will be those in this world who exalt themselves in proud rebellion over against God and over against Christ. They boast in their power and their knowledge and their wisdom and their human pride, and they will stumble at the Christ. They will stumble at the preaching of the cross, and they will fall into perdition. And at the cross, the thoughts of many shall be revealed.
their wickedness, over against God and over against the Christ shall be revealed. But this same gospel will serve for the rising again of many, the humble, the godly, those who confess their sins before him, those who acknowledge their own unworthiness, those who come to the cross of Jesus Christ by his Spirit, and by his grace, they shall be exalted in the presence of God. Though they are the downtrodden of the world, hated by the world, in the presence of God in Jesus Christ, they shall be saved. Simeon goes on to prophesy personally about Mary. A sword also shall pierce through thine own soul. This was a word specifically to Mary. Mary had a wonderful role in that she was the mother of the Lord Jesus Christ, but it was not a role that was without difficulty. It involved great difficulty. It involved the sorrow of standing before the cross and witnessing the crucifixion of not only her own son, but of that one whom she believed to be the Messiah. And she did not and she could not at the time fully comprehend the reason for this. She saw the wickedness of those who crucified him and a sword, and the word here is for a big sword, a sword pierced through her own soul, but the day would come when she would have hope and joy and gladness, when Jesus, the Christ of God, the Son of God, would arise from the dead. And so he too will reveal to his people the glorious hope, the light, the hope of salvation and of righteousness in the midst of an ungodly world. And so he does, beloved, through the preaching of the gospel today. We declare unto you the glory of Jesus Christ and the greatness of his salvation through the spirit of Christ in our hearts. We behold him, and through faith we have in our heart the peace of God that passes all understanding. How and why? Because we have seen Jesus. No, we have not seen him with our physical eyes. But though we do not see him with our physical eyes, as Peter tells us in his epistle, we rejoice in him with joy unspeakable and full of glory. And should Jesus tarry in his coming unto the day when our earthly pilgrimage is over. We will not be afraid as long as we have the spirit of Jesus Christ and the faith of Jesus Christ. We have in our heart and in our soul the consolation, the comfort of God's people, for we have seen Jesus the God of our salvation. We have the hope that after this life we shall see him in glory and then our joy shall be made perfect and we will dwell in everlasting peace in the presence of God and in the favor of Jesus Christ. Amen.
Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, we thank thee for thy word. We thank thee for its revelation of Jesus Christ. We thank thee for the wonder that we celebrate in this season of the year, the incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ. May our consideration of that great wonder be one of faith so that we have the spiritual understanding to know, to see, and to behold in Jesus Christ the wonder of our salvation, the peace and the hope and the consolation of thy people for Jesus' sake. Amen. Let us sing now the Song of Simeon as it's found in the spiritual songs that are in our Psalter following the songs with musical scores, the Song of Simeon, sung to the tune of Psalter number 163. Let us sing this entire song. <laughs>
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be and abide with you all. Amen. Thank you. 